Okay, good afternoon. Our speaker and visitor today is Vaclav Pavlik, uh, who got the PhD in 2019 and remained for a postdoc at the Astronomical Institute of the Czech Academy of Science in Prague. Then he moved to Indiana in the US, Indiana University in Bloomington for a postdoc, and then he became visiting professor. And now since June of this year, he is uh, back in Prague with a Marisa Lodowska Curie postdoc fellowship. And today he will tell us about the neurotropic stellar velocity and how we to use them to understand better star cluster evolution. Please. Thank you. And um, thank you for having me and thank you for the audience being such numerous. Um, how many of you here are studying, researching star clusters? Please raise your hand. How many of you are doing models of star clusters? How many of you are doing observations of star clusters? Okay, but generally speaking, what I'm doing are models. Don't take it personally. For me, a star is a point mass. Um, if I calculate uh, stellar evolution in my systems, my models, which is not going to be included today, it's just a number for me. It's a white board so between star and star. You're not sharing the screen. I'm sharing the screen. You need that, but not on not Oh, screen. well, then let me fix that, hopefully. Share screen. Okay. Let yep. share. Perfect. Now let's do it again. <laughs> everyone can see so um yeah so if if you include stellar evolution in my models it's just a label what the star is doing and you have uh, pre-calculated tables so but generally you can get some idea of uh what a star cluster is doing by studying its models and i will show you actually in the first uh in the introduction that you need models to be able to understand star cluster dynamics Star clusters come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, you can have groups and associations counting few stars um, with uh, age varies and you would usually find them in a disk. Open clusters that are more populous um, have ages around 300 million years or up to 300 million years. You would also find them typically in a disk. Young massive clusters uh, all over the galaxy. Globular clusters, which is the topic I will cover today, uh, they usually have more than 100,000 stars. The masses are uh, tens of thousands of solar masses to a million solar masses. They usually are more old, older than a giga year, um, and they are found in the halo, in the bulge, and in the disk of galaxies. And then, of course, if you extend this definition of clusters uh, beyond these typical groups, you could also have the nuclear cluster, which is usually in the center of galaxies. But... Today, we'll focus on global clusters, but you can see from the location of these objects that star clusters are really the building blocks of galaxies. So that's why they're important, not only for uh, their own evolution, but also for galactic evolution. And they are also the places where stars are born, especially in the young star clusters. So they basically connect uh, stellar evolution, star formation with the dynamics of uh, galaxies and in extent uh, by the whole, uh, to the whole universe. So they are really important uh, for us. But look at the age spread. That thing goes from hundreds of millions of years to billions of years, basically to the whole age of the universe. So you really need good observations. You need good theory that can describe what you see. And you need good models, because without models, even with hundreds or thousands of human lifetimes, you would not be able to see any major global evolutionary change in the objects that you can observe. So you need those three things combined to be able to investigate what star clusters are doing. Often star clusters and globular clusters are thought of as fish.
now I muted it. It was definitely okay. muted. Can you hear me now, someone? Yes, now we can. Okay, how many people are there? As I was dragging it away, I probably muted it by accident. I'm sorry for that. Eight. <clears throat> Is it better? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, so the prescription varies for uh, different velocities of that star, but what is important is this term m squared, because dynamical friction acts more on massive stars than low mass stars. And as the more massive stars are losing velocity, they are spiraling towards the cluster center and are responsible for an effect that we call mass segregation. Basically, your cluster will evolve in such a way that most massive stars will occupy the center of the cluster, while the less massive stars will occupy the halo in the outer regions. And you can sort of have a nice ordering, quote unquote, ordering of stars in a cluster. So that's first um, effect that you need to remember. The second one is relaxation time. A star cluster evolves on basically two time scales. One is crossing time. It's a short time scale for a star of typical velocity to cross the cluster from one end to the other, crossing time. The other term is relaxation time. And that is um, linked to the parallel, uh, uh, sorry, perpendicular component of velocity. So if we lost some velocity in this direction, in the parallel direction, by encountering a field star, if you encounter this field star, your perpendicular velocity component will increase. And by encountering more and more of these field stars, you would receive different fixed in random directions, which will increase your uh, velocity dispersion. And basically after one relaxation time, whatever the time scale is, your star will forget its initial conditions. It won't know where it came from because of these random peaks, small peaks in random motion, in a random direction. And that term depends on velocity dispersion and inversely on the field stellar mass and density, or you can rewrite it in terms of the size, this is the half mass radius, size of the system and the number of stars in that system. So for bigger system, relaxation time would be longer, for larger systems, it would be longer. Or smaller system or more compact systems, it would be shorter. So for galaxies, you would have 10 to 10 years, right? Galaxies are not relaxed, but clusters are supposed to be relaxed. So relaxation time mass segregation. Now, if you investigate what's happening to a cluster when it's evolving, starting from some initial conditions here at time zero, as mass segregation and all these dynamical processes are happening in the cluster, the inner parts of the cluster would shrink and the outer parts would increase, uh, would sort of diffuse. And what I'm um, plotting here are so-called Lagrangian radia, which means if you would take the star cluster and look at positions of shells that have fixed mass in the concentric shells with fixed mass and look at how they evolve, they are evolving. You can plot the radii, those are called Lagrangian radii, and you would see that if you fix 1% of the mass of the cluster, it starts here and would shrink and then starts doing weird stuff. If you focus on 50% of the mass, which is the half mass radius we saw earlier, this thing here, RH, you would sort of see it stays constant and it slightly expands after this, this point. That point is important and we call it core collapse. It's um, taken from analytical uh, theory of star cluster evolution. If you would have an analytical model or gas model, you would really reach a point where the center reaches infinite density in finite time. The thing that's stopping for collapse in clusters where you have stars is actually the discreteness of the system because you cannot shrink a star to an infinite density, right? So basically, if you have discrete stars, if you have discrete point stars in your system, and especially binary stars were born there, they would suck the energy from the system and start expanding. And uh, depending on how your system, how big your system is, you could also see these wobbles here, which are called uh, gravel thermal oscillations. And this is, in a nutshell, basic um, dynamics of star clusters.
one more term I need to specify here. And that is when you have random encounters between stars, you are distributing energy, kinetic energy between the particles. And initially, if you would plot mass of particles and their velocity dispersion, if you would have no prescription what any star should have as velocity or kinetic energy, velocity dispersion, you would start with something flat. Basically, regardless of mass, your velocity dispersion is the same throughout the system. But now as the system is evolving, because of mass segregation and all these dynamical processes, high mass stars are sinking towards the cluster center. They are losing velocity. They are decreasing their velocity dispersion while the low mass stars are increasing velocity dispersion. So by these random encounters, you would have this happen. And if you wait long enough, you should see the system evolve in a really nice ordered state, which would which we call energy repartition. I will shorten it as EEP because it's really long word and it doesn't fit in my slides. Observers in the audience could see, uh, could recognize this formula that velocity dispersion is proportional to the power law of mass. And you can determine the exponent to sort of quantify what the degree of the partition is in the system. Bianchini in 2016 found a better way to cover a larger range of masses uh, for quantifying uh, velocity dispersion. And it's, again, velocity dispersion here, but this time an exponential function between stellar mass and inversely proportional to some parameter that we call equipartition mass. I will explain it a bit more. So remember that plot Bianchini's paper, basically the same thing, right? If you plot it log scale to log scale, it will look like that. If you have linear scale to log scale, you can see there is a slope. And that slope, inverse of that slope, taken with negative, tells you what the equipartition mass is, tells you what energy equipartition degree of energy equipartition is in the system. So basically, those are the definitions. Because it's inverse, inversely proportional, look here. You have the equipartition mass on the vertical axis and log of sigma over m sort of to satisfy whatever is here to have this linearly. And it's an inversely proportional um, relationship. So if you have no equipartition in the system, your MEQ is infinite. Basically flat means infinite, one over, right? Zero, one over zero is infinite. But one over zero is either plus infinity or minus infinity. So both of these are no equipartition. Now, if you want to move towards equipartition, you need to lower MEQ in a positive sense. And basically MEQ approaches zero uh, is from, from the positive side leads to equipartition and system. And if you would approach zero from the negative side, it would mean that your high mass stars are getting high velocity dispersion than your low mass stars, something you would not expect in a system um, such as a cluster or system which is randomly uh, exchanging kinetic energy between particles. So our motivation for the study I'm about to present is that the classic picture of uh, global cluster dynamic evolution was challenged by new theoretical and observational studies, starting with HST and Gaia that showed that global clusters often display internal rotation and radially anisotropic velocity distribution, something that was you know, not isotropic anymore. Um, theoretically, rotating clusters have been investigated. They lose memory of initial rotation due to tubular relaxation. Angular momentum is carried away. Velocity anisotropy could be connected with structural properties and evolutionary stages and mass loss. Um, more papers than, uh, there are more papers than I could fit on this slide. This spurred new observational discoveries and HST measured sigma, the velocity dispersion, with respect to mass and was able to determine energy partition in some systems. And it was surprisingly found that energy partition is not achieved in global clusters. More theoretical works that investigated what is the effect of two water relaxation and energy partition and what can velocity anisotropy tell you about the system that you're studying? 
uh, it can tell you something about the formation history, dynamical evolution, multiple stellar populations, evidence of the central mass, uh, central intermediate mass black hole. So all that motivated us to do numerical models uh, that would start with different initial conditions to sort of try to map them to the observations. We had a global cluster with 100,000 stars, uh, evolved initial mass function of an old system, external tidal field because star clusters are never isolated. They live in the galaxy, so you can either have a really quick tidal filling cluster, which lives in a strong tidal field, or underfilling cluster, which lives in a weak tidal field. Uh, you rarely ever start without binaries because binary stars are uh, formed um, in the cluster either during core collapse or even primordially uh, due to star formation. So we took models with and without primordial binaries. Um, and now we also took models with isotropic and radially anisotropic velocity distributions. You don't have to remember that because that's plotted here. Isotropic means that this velocity dispersion parameter here is um, zero throughout the system. This is radius. This is parameter beta, is zero. And radial and isotropic in this profile means that you start with zero in the core and sort of increase radial and isotropic as you move out from the cluster. So just something to differentiate the initial conditions. And this could be due to um, the formation scenario of the cluster from a cold collapse of uh, larger uh, cloud and then forming stars. So you would have this radially falling stars inwards. Now, if you take those initial conditions and let them evolve, something interesting happens. And you could see that the evolution towards energy partition uh, depends on the initial radial isotropy in velocity dispersion. I will get to that specifically later. That you can study the radial and tangential velocity components, and it also depends on the cluster sending distance in the cluster where you are, if you are in the core or in, in the outer regions. Um, it also, there is a dependence on the strength of the galactic tidal field, the presence of bi binary star population, and we also compared it to observational parameters so that uh, your 3D models and 2D observations could sort of be matched against each other. And in the last study, we also found relationship between dynamical evolution and mass segregation and uh, differences in the evolution of binary stars. So the first really important plot is here. You remember the blue plot I showed you before for collapse and oscillations. That was the isotropic model. Now, if you include anisotropy in that model, anisotropy that would have that half mass radius here, half mass radius is about half of beta. If you include that, suddenly your evolution is extended by one and a half relaxation times. If you have slightly less anisotropy, your anisotropy radius would be two half mass radii, you're sort of approaching the isotropic case. Basically, the isotropic means that your radius where you would increase anisotropy would be infinity. So this is this is new. No one was expecting that this could happen, that you could actually extend the two-body relaxation processes by, um, or you would expect that to happen, but no one was studying that um, you could extend the two-body relaxation processes by having an isotropy in the system. The second important result, remember what the parameter MEQ was, the equipartition mass, is how it evolves in the central region. So here I compare isotropic with blue again, radial isotropic cluster with red, and you start here really high, infinity, basically infinity, right? 100 is basically infinity in this scale because your masses are 1.1 1. 1 to 1. So you start with no equipartition in the system, and your parameter MEQ is decreasing, which means the cluster is evolving towards equipartition. Then you hit core collapse. There is a signature of core collapse here. And then you sort of flatten the profile. That's the core, right? Both evolve towards equipartition never achieve it in the full mass range. If you look around the half mass radius, it's not as deep, but still both clusters are evolving towards energy equipartition. They still never achieve it. 
Now, if you look in the outer regions, now one plot with positive MEQ does not um, show the whole picture. Now we need to go to negative equipartition mass as well, which means basically the outer regions of your isotropic cluster are evolving away from equipartition to the inverted case where high mass stars would have higher velocity dispersion than low mass stars. Why is that? Well, if you look separately at the component, radial and tangential components of velocity dispersion, radial being crosses, tangential being circles, you can sort of see that around the half mass radius, the evolution is similar in both components. And in the outer regions, the tangential component in the radial anisotropic cluster is decreasing, going towards equipartition, and the radial is just oscillating around infinity. Nothing interesting there. But if you look into the isotropic case, you still see the same kind of evolution around half mass radius, but now the tangential component of your stars of velocity dispersion is lives in the negative regime and your radial component tries to reach equipartition. So basically by having, uh, by allowing the cluster to expand, you're allowing the low mass stars to leave the cluster to diffuse while the high mass stars are segregating inwards, which means that they would have higher tangential velocity dispersion than low mass stars who are diffusing in the isotropic case. And um, yeah, this is something that if you are observing clusters, um, I would like you to see measure, but it's in the outer regions, which are really difficult to measure. So just, you know, if you measure something like that in the outer regions, you can see whether the cluster started as isotropic or anisotropic. Now, mass segregation, which is the second and last result I will present. Um, we said that mass segregation depends on the stellar mass and, you know, the dynamical relaxation processes. If you have a system, now I'm including binaries here, which first difference is that the core collapse is not as deep and not as steep because you already have binaries that are sucking the energy from the core. So your core collapse is sort of mild. That's the first difference. But if you look at the evolution of the isotropic model and radial anisotropic model, you can still see the same feature as we had with, without binaries that core collapse in the former, in the isotropic case, is earlier than core collapse in the radial anisotropic case. You can also investigate the mass segregation on that. And basically by separating high mass stars and low mass stars in around 1%, which is this radius, I'm separating this radius into high mass stars and low mass stars and 70% radius, this one, into just high mass stars and low mass stars. You can see that high mass stars in the outer regions of the anisotropic cluster are segregating more rapidly than in the isotropic case. And it's inverted in the inner regions where the isotropic case, the isotropic center is segregating in the center more rapidly than the anisotropic one. The low mass stars are doing the same. They, they are spreading out, diffusing. So there's no much difference between these two models. But what's really interesting is that the anisotropic model has faster mass segregation in the outer regions and slower in the inner regions. So sort of, quote unquote, it makes a course of high mass stars, higher mass stars. And that's because, again, if you think about it, you have a radially anisotropic model, which means the outer stars already have some radial component. So they are able to sink in more rapidly than in the isotropic case where the movement of stars is tangential and radial is sort of in the same, um, by the same percentage. And so you have to wait for relaxation processes to kick in and segregate the stars. And in the center, you have, again, some stars that are moving on radial orbits. So they would sort of leave the clusters for, while in the isotropic case, they would just sink in or um, higher percentage of those stars would uh, sink in. So that's the second result. I had, um, I can leave you with my conclusions and take any questions. Thank you.
questions for our speaker? Start with one, <clears throat> which is, so everything you show basically suggests me despite waiting several session times, the final evolutionary stage of your system do carry memory of the initial conditions. Yes. Was this expected before end or? Well, so, so they set it to sort of different equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> interesting in the sense that what I said at the beginning is the classic theory that tells you that one relaxation time is enough to forget the initial conditions. We see that it's not. So after seven, eight, it was still yes. Is that level of difference something one can put to measures? You know? I don't know. That so many observers <laughs> answer that question. Observers in the room. Observers in the room. Hopefully. Um, so so far. We got a follow up from Laura Watkins, but she was only able to measure the inner regions and she found it consistent with what we said. But in the inner regions, you sort of don't see the difference that much. Like when it comes to velocity dispersion profiles, you would really need to see the outer regions of, of a cluster. And mm -hmm. I'm, I need to remind you those are star clusters that can really that can expand really far. If you would have tidal limitation on that cluster, the whole story would be different. Would Gaia be enough to measure velocity dispersions in the outer region of the cluster? It would not. Yeah, well, it would. <laughs> but the problem is, I feel like you would have so few measurements of stars that you could actually. Um, Assume the membership to the cluster. No, I, well, if, if you, I mean, if, if I had to to guess, mm -hmm. if you take a nearby globular cluster, mm -hmm. I mean, it's also less crowded because it's nearby, yeah. so you don't have crowded issues and such. Mm -hmm. You have thousands of stars. If you have a massive one, a couple of three kiloparsec away, I would bet you have thousands of stars members in the outer region. Okay. How, how much out there? Uh, 70 to 90, you know, basically above 70% of the total mass, which in terms of half light uh, radii would be, this is half mass, but that's basically the same yeah. thing. So two, two half light radii and above. 20 of stars. 20 of stars, okay. Well, let's wait for Gaia. <laughs> There's something. Any other question? Uh, Sure. Nice talk. Uh, you mentioned the importance uh, of rotation from the cluster. And so I think uh, you, you could do also some simulation with the uh, Osikov merit tangential and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I expect uh, maybe the opposite trend with respect to radial and so on. Mm -hmm. So the question is do you have some hint about the interplay of rotation and radial anisotropy? So they have a competitive effect uh, or they go in the same direction. Right. Considering the first part of the question, I am currently working on a paper. It's went to the authors for the third time already, uh, where we include tangential model. Okay. And we see exactly what you said. It was just the hunch that you would see the opposite trend and you see the opposite trend, which is really nice. So you see earlier collapse and um, basically the opposite when it concerns mass segregation, right? So that's the first part of your question. The second one was uh, rotation and radio horizontal. Yes. Well, rotation, you would, um, the inner regions tend to isotropize really fast, basically under one relaxation path. They would become isotropic, even if you start with radial anisotropy throughout the system or tangential anisotropy, you would get isotropic kind of center of the system. Um, but depending on the strength of the tidal field, you could develop rotation in the outer parts or tangential anisotropy in the outer parts. If you start stripping those stars that now can expand, they can expand uh, like seven times, right? Seven times the, um, the initial radius of the cluster. You are developing these radial orbits, those really extended radial orbits. If you put the cluster in a stronger tidal field, you get rid of all these stars that are moving outside. So your outer regions would develop tangential anisotropy. Yes. And also because uh, stripping 
of stars in a tidal field is more effective in a prograde motion than in retrograde motion, you would develop some kind of rotation in the outer regions. And that's uh, a work by Maria Tionko, 2016, her thesis. She did a pretty good job on um, investigating this with the outer region. Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you.